Okay, let's address the bones of the upper limb. We're going to study the bones of the upper limb and their various features. First thing that we always need to remember as we approach the bones is that, at least from a medical standpoint, the bones are very important landmarks, physical landmarks, to identify and locate other soft tissues in the human body. We often, uh, in our ability to locate nerves or blood vessels or other structures, will use land, bony landmarks as a feature for that. In this picture you see the clavicle, the collarbone, and we've all had a chance to palpate our own, and we know these are at the base of our neck. Perhaps you have noticed where the two clavicles come together in the center over the breastbone called the sternum, that a U-shaped bony notch is formed there. That's a particularly important landmark to locate various things in the neck. Sometimes uh, if a surgical procedure is required to open an airway, uh, perhaps something in the nose or throat has totally blocked the passageway for air, sometimes the trachea, the windpipe, needs to be opened right here just above the jugular notch in the neck. And so this feature is an important point for locating the best place to do that. You can also see out at the point of the shoulder, the acromion process is the bony uh, point of the shoulder. Uh, no matter how much muscle is there, the shoulder muscles come into that point, attached to that point. You can always palpate a bony feature right at the tip of the shoulder called the acromion process. And of course, so many other places as you move down the arm at the elbow, there are a number of bony features there, including what we call the elbow ourselves. Um, you can palpate the edges of your scapula on your back. Um, there are bony landmarks um, throughout your hand and just on either side of the wrist as well. So, important that we know many of these names so that we can locate other features from there. Let's begin with the bones themselves. Here's an image of both the right and the left upper limb, and it involves a girdle of bone around the upper part. Uh, this is what anchors it into the torso, and there are two bones here, the clavicle, which is the collarbone, when you see there right in front, and then attached to the distal end or the lateral end of that clavicle is the scapula. The scapula is located on the posterior side of the rib cage, as you can see, and together these two bones form what we call the pectoral girdle. If you know the lower limb, the lower limb has a pelvic girdle of bone, and it's built for stability. The upper limb here is built for flexibility. The uh, pelvic girdle is a complete ring of bone with the two coxa and the sacrum. Here in the upper limb, the clavicle anchors into the sternum, but the scapula simply floats over the back. There is no skeletal attachment um, for the scapula to anything in the back, the rib cage or the vertebra or anything else. Um, the clavicle is totally responsible for the location of the scapula and its attachment to the human to the rest of the human body. So the scapula forms the socket for the upper limb bone, which is known as the humerus. And this comes into play, I think, when uh, there are times when people hit their elbow in just the right way and uh, engage a nerve and get sort of a little electric jolt out of that. And they often say, I hit my funny bone, and of course it's got to be due to the fact that this bone is called the humerus. So the humerus is the single upper limb bone. Uh, notice how much like the femur this is. It doesn't have a long neck and a ball-like head, but in many, many respects it's the same, and you'll see that shortly as we uh, 
as we work our way through each of these bones. In the forearm, there are two bones. Again, this mirrors the lower limb. The lower limb has a tibia and a fibula. Here in the upper limb, these two bones are known as the radius and the ulna. The radius is the lateral of the two bones. The ulna is the medial of the two bones. These two bones each form a unique joint at the elbow. And we'll talk about those joints a bit later, but important that you see that these two are there. The radius is always the lateral of the two bones, the outside one, and the ulna is always the medial one. And then, of course, these two bones have attached to them the hand with its various features. And if you've already studied the lower limb, as my class has, the hand is laid out exactly like the foot with a group of short bones in the foot called tarsals. Here they're called carpals. And with that said, you then know what the long bones in the hand would be, since the short bones at the wrist are called carpals. The long bones through the hands, through the palm of the hand and into the thumb, are called metacarpals, like the metatarsals in the foot. And then the phalanges are the bones in the fingers, and both the foot and the hand have 14 phalanges. If you've previously learned the names of each of the 14 phalanges in the foot, then you already know them here in the hand. They are identical. So let's begin by looking at each of the bones. Let's look at each one one at a time, and I'll point out some of the features that you'll probably have questions about, and hopefully I will get to each of those for you. So let's begin with the clavicle. The clavicle is the collarbone. It's attached to the torso, and in fact, it's probably important to point out here that this joint, it's called the sternoclavicular joint because it's between the sternum and the clavicle. This joint in the center of your chest is really the only skeletal articulation between the entire upper limb and the, and the torso and the, the core of your body. Uh, as I said before, the scapula simply floats. The clavicle holds it in place so this spot is the only skeletal articulation or skeletal joint between the entire upper limb and the torso. The only features that are truly important here on the clavicle at this point are the two ends of the clavicle. And if you have one handy, um, it would be good to look at the two ends. And what you'll notice is that one end if you look at it on end, not from the side, but end and end, you'll notice that one end has a very round appearance to it, and the other end has a flat appearance to it, as I've drawn in those circles. It's hard to see that when you're looking at the picture of the bone here uh, in this slide, and that's because we're looking down on the clavicle from above, and so both ends kind of look wide. But if you look at the picture just above that, the picture with the scapula, the clavicle, and the humerus in it, you can see that the medial end or the sternal end of the bone is taller, is thicker above. And if you look at the other end out where it attaches into the scapula, it's thinner. So you can tell clearly the two ends of the clavicle um, by their general appearance. And the, the height of that sternal end is what creates that notch. And the narrowness of the distal or lateral end matches the shape of the feature of the scapula that this attaches to, which is called the acromion process of the scapula. And we'll get to that in just a moment. So... You might want to look at various images of the scapula, I'm sorry, of the clavicle, 
from various standpoints and uh, make sure that you know this this bone and can identify one end from the other. Uh, although we're going to do this in a video image here, it is important that at some point you handle the bones themselves and really get to know those. So that's the clavicle. Let's now turn our attention to the scapula. And here's the scapula and its position on the posterior side of the body. Let's get oriented first and notice that um, the scapula, when it sits on the posterior side of the body, then the posterior side of the scapula is the superficial side, and the anterior side faces against the rib cage and is the deep side. Um, the long pointed end goes down, um, the somewhat rounded socket shape is going to point out into the shoulder where the humerus is going to attach to it. So you, you do want to get your bearings and how this, this bone fits against, uh, fits against the rib cage. And that's, that's important for getting to know the bone as well. We're going to sort of separate out the scapula all by itself for a moment here, but you have to continue to picture its position on the human body. If you happen to have a scapula to study as you're watching this, <clears throat> you may want to see if you can fit that onto somebody's back nearby and really see how that sits with the rest of the rib cage. So now let's look at the scapula alone. Let's look at it by itself. And here's a picture of the anterior side of the scapula to your uh, left and the posterior side of the scapula to your right. Um, very important that you can tell one side from the other. And probably the most prominent feature is that ridge in the upper 20% of the bone that runs from side to side. If you're on the anterior, the deep surface, you don't see that. It's just a smooth, shallow surface that fits the rib cage. The right side picture is the posterior picture with this big ridge, and that's the part that sticks out from your back. Now, it's helpful when you study this. We're going to have 15 different features that we want to locate here. Um, but it's helpful to look at it from a geometric perspective. If this was a geometry class, I would ask you, what is the shape of this bone? And hopefully you would not tell me it's a square or a circle, but that you would tell me it's, yeah, it's really the shape of a triangle. And I know from my geometry days that I learned a couple of things about a triangle. It has three sides, and it has three angles or three corners. Um, we call those corners angles. And the number three is going to be very, very helpful to us here. As we study the scapula, we're going to find that there are really five groups of three. And this makes the study of the scapula much easier than trying to learn 15 things if we learn three or five groups of three. And so... Um, what do we have? Well, a triangle has three sides, so this bone has three sides, three edges, and each of those edge, edges has a name. So it's just natural. Learn the three sides names altogether. The bone has three angles, although let's qualify that. There are only two simple angles. Um, the ones facing the inside, above and below, are just simple corners. And you can see those. The third angle, the one that's lateral on the bone here, whichever picture you're looking at, is really very busy. There are a number of processes. You can see the socket of the bone is there. And so it doesn't have a specific simple name like the other two do. So really... Although we think of a triangle as having three angles, only two of them are named as angles. The other one is just too busy for that. There are going to be three glenoid objects, and we'll point those out in a minute. There are three processes or bony projections from the bone. 
and those are all up sort of surrounding the socket itself. And then there are three fosses or three hollowed out areas, two on one side and one on the other, one on the anterior side, two on the other side, and then finally a scapular notch. And if you look at the upper edge of the bone, the superior um, border of the bone, um, right next to that little curve or crooked finger-like piece, you see a little cutout there, which is the scapular notch. So I've created a, an image here that colors in the various features of the bone, so you really get a good sense of how broad or how um, extensive each of these is. Scapular notch on the list is that little U-shaped cutout that you can see there in the left side picture. The acromion process is the bright yellow feature that sticks right out um, over where the socket is. The coracoid process is that crooked finger-like feature that is actually pointing anteriorly, pointing forward. You can see that the acromion, if you look at the right side picture, the acromion is attached to a long purple ridge-like piece, and that's what holds the acromion in place what positions it where it is. Um, and that purple piece is called the spine of the scapula. So these are the three processes that I was mentioning before. The acromion process, the coracoid process, and this could be the spinous process, but it is very much known in uh, anatomical and medical circles as simply the spine of the scapula. So there are three processes clustered around about the upper part of the bone and particularly near uh, the socket of the bone. Now, focus on the spine for a moment, that purple ridge that you see to the right. And you can see that there's a hollowed out place above the spine and the very next uh, Feature in green says supraspinous fossa. The supra prefix is simply a shortened form of superior. So above the spine fossa is that hollowed out area right above the spine, supraspinous fossa. The pink area below that is the infra spinous fossa, literally below the spine, hollowed out area. And that area right there is shallow. The borders, the edges of the bone are raised, are thicker a little bit, and the center is a little thinner. So it's just a slightly hollowed out area. And then what was the first one there in yellow shows on the deep side of the scapula. And that whole um, sort of curved, hollowed area on the deep side of the bone is the part of the bone that fits against the rib cage. And it's a fossa known as the subscapular fossa, right? There's no spine on this side, so it's not going to be a spinous fossa. The sub prefix means under, like a submarine is a boat that goes under the water. So subscapular would be found on the underside or the deep side of the bone, and that's exactly where it is. So the spine helps us locate the two fossas on the posterior side, and there's a single fossa there on the deep side, but three fossas. So three processes, three fossas, three borders. The edges of the bone are known as the borders, the superior border above, very short, leading to the scapular notch and then the axillary border and vertebral border. Um, in some textbooks, these are simply known as the medial border and the lateral border. I prefer to use vertebral and axillary because they reinforce other anatomical knowledge. Um, for example, if you can picture the humerus in the socket, uh, that red curved socket-like area, the bone coming down, the area between the humerus and the scapula is where the armpit would be. And of course, axillary is our word for armpit. So the edge of the bone facing into the armpit is going to be referred to as the axillary border. And of course, the very long border on the medial side, 
is facing into the vertebral column. And perhaps you could visualize the vertebral column running right down through the center of this picture. And that would be the border that's there. If you use medial and lateral, I would not mark it wrong. Um, but I think you're going to learn and remember and be and reinforce more human anatomy if you use axillary and vertebral. And then the two angles. Notice the um, along the vertebral border there, the superior angle is in sort of a teal color, and the inferior angle is in a purple color. The very corners of the, the bone there are the two angles. The other angle is, is so busy, and it's busy primarily with the socket and those little bony processes that help support bones and muscles and ligaments and other structures that hold this socket in place. The socket itself is the glenoid fossa. Um, some books call it the glenoid cavity, but it's truly only a cavity when it has the rest of itself. And the socket here kind of is, is the shape of a teardrop on the bone, but there is a lip of cartilage that is attached that makes the socket more cup-like. And with the cartilage attached, um, the reference is to the glenoid cavity. But when we have the bone just by itself, it's, it's proper to call it the glenoid fossa, with a little hollowed out area there. Now, there's then two glenoid tubercles, a supraglenoid, again, above the socket tubercle, a little bumpy structure, and an infraglenoid tubercle, or a below the glenoid fossa, little lump, and you can see the yellow and the purple dots that represent the location on your bone where you would find those two tubercles. These are very important landmarks, uh, attachment sites for the muscles of the upper part of the arm. So the, those glenoid structures are really right there where that third angle would be. But looking at the whole picture then you can see you've got three processes, three fossas, three borders, uh, two angles, three glenoid objects, and the scapular notch then is fills in the other one of the 15. So study these well. Um, use these pictures that show you the whole color of the bone to really identify it well. And we're good. So there's your scapula. Now, of course, the bone that anchors into the scapula is the humerus. Uh, the humerus is remarkably like the femur. If you've already studied the femur, you could pick out the head here. Um, what is different about this bone is that there are two necks to the humerus. And some people find that odd, but uh, let's think about it for a moment. The head here is not a ball like it is in the femur. It's more of a dome shape. And the neck of any bone is where the head narrows into the rest or the, the body of the bone. And when we look at this bone, the neck is very, very small. It's just a simple little groove, a simple little indentation immediately below the dome of the head. So anatomically, locationally, what we mean by the definition of a neck, the neck should be placed right here. It would be very wide, about as wide as the head itself. But we need to take into consideration that from a practical aspect, from a medical aspect, from a surgical aspect, um, the neck of a bone usually represents one of the narrowest parts of the bone. And if something needs to be altered in the bone, if the bone maybe has been broken and heals wrong and has to be rebroken or reset or whatever, um, it's usually done at the neck of the bone. And so it would be much more natural to call, to call the narrowing of the bone from this entire lumpy end the head and all the other little lumps up there where they narrow into the shaft of the bone is to identify that 
as the surgical neck. And I've drawn a red line there, but we're talking about just the entire surrounding area there where the wide part is narrowing into the shaft. That we would refer to as the surgical neck. So also at this proximal end of the bone are three features which in some ways mirror the objects of the femur, if you've studied that. Uh, there are two tubercles, a greater tubercle and a lesser tubercle. Let me take you to another picture that probably shows this a little bit better. Um, so here um, I've colored in the two tubercles, and maybe if you have studied the femur, you know there's a greater trochanter and a lesser trochanter. Well, here at this same end, there's a greater tubercle and a lesser tubercle. These features are not as big as what a trochanter would be. But the greater, tro the greater tubercle here, for instance, is exactly in the same position as what would be the greater trochanter. It's 180 degrees from the head of the bone. So it's, it's wide and sort of massive. The lesser tubercle <clears throat> is right beside it, but on the anterior side of the bone rather than the posterior as the lesser trochanter would be in the femur. So from the anterior view of the bone, which is on your left, the anterior feature of the bone, you're going to see a prominent lesser tubercle, and in between the two tubercles there's going to be a vertical groove that you see in purple. It's called the intertubercular groove, or between the tubercles groove. So it's a, it's a shallow, lengthy, sort of U-shaped area that uh, makes itself a groove. So, three features here. In fact, the, probably the easy way to study this end of the bone is to say, okay, there are two groups of three. There's the head and the two necks. Study those. And then there are the three tubercular things, greater and lesser tubercles and the inner tubercular groove. On the shaft of the bone, you see only one feature there. It's on the lateral side of the bone, not anterior or posterior, but lateral. It's immediately under the greater tubercle. It's known as the deltoid tuberosity. And if you can locate your deltoid muscle, you know it covers the front side and back of the entire shoulder area. And its fibers narrow down and from the roundness of the shoulder itself they narrow down into a point that attaches itself here on this feature to the lateral side of the bone. And what you would see is a very narrow V-shaped area that would be roughened there. For us this is the only feature on the bone itself that's going to be found at the shaft. Now finally let's go to the distal end of the humerus and here again we see a feature, features that are very much like the femur, if you know the femur. Uh, the femur has two condyles, two epicondyles, and a fossa. And here we're going to have two condyles, two epicondyles, and two fossas. So really a 2-2-2 two, two, two arrangement. Um, the two epicondyles are probably easiest to locate right off the bat. Um, if you pinch your elbow at its widest point and feel the bony projections, medial and lateral, those are the epicondyles of the humerus. You see them colored in here. The lateral epicondyle is not very big, colored, colored in red here. The medial epicondyle is much more prominent, colored with a teal colored here. So those are probably the easy ones to identify. Condyles are defined as smooth joint surfaces. And if you remember the distal end of the femur had two very rounded uh, objects that you couldn't really tell apart. They were two uh, rounded knuckle-like structures that fit onto the tibia. Here, the two condyles have different shapes. Look at the yellow feature 
and the green feature. These two are shaped so differently that rather than calling them medial and lateral condyles, which they are, we're going to give them proper names. So the feature to the lateral side, the one next to the lateral epicondyle, is the capitulum. And hopefully you remember that cap or caput is the Latin word for your head. This is why the piece of clothing that you put on a head is called a cap. You're speaking Latin when you say baseball cap. And somebody thought that the roundness of this uh, looked like uh, the bald head of some guy. So it's got that definite round ball-like feature that we could say is similar to a head. The other one the medial, what would be the medial condyle, is the yellow feature. Notice that you can see it both anteriorly and posteriorly, whereas you can't do that with the capitulum. The capitulum only shows on the anterior side of the bone. Um, sometimes the trochlea uh, is thought of as sort of a lopsided bow tie, sort of narrow in the middle and wide on the ends. Uh, maybe you can see that. The name technically comes from the Latin word for a pulley. Not sure if you know what the mechanical device called a pulley is. It's a sort of a metal housing with a wheel that spins in this metal housing. And that wheel is usually grooved. You put a rope through it and it's attached above your head and the rope then can be pulled down and can hoist something off the ground. Um, somebody thought the wheel in that pulley with the groove in it, the narrow part of it to keep the rope running in the center of the wheel, looked a bit like this feature here. So it's known as the trochlea. Remember, if you will, the CH letters in any Latin word are pronounced as the letter K. So a trochlea and a capitulum, lateral epicondyle, medial epicondyle. And finally, on the anterior side of the bone and on the posterior side of the bone are two fossas. The fossas are indentations, hollowed out areas. And in fact, if you pinch the bone front to back, your two fingers would be exactly opposite each other. The anterior one is known as the coronoid fossa. It's right above the, or right above the trochlea. And the posterior one is much deeper and known as the olecranon fossa. And you see it there on the posterior side of the bone. The anterior picture is on the left, and the posterior picture is on the right here. Very important that you do get to know what the anterior and the posterior side of the bone look like. I would say for the anterior side of the bone, that inner tubercular groove and the little lesser tubercle pointing out really define the front of the bone and the fact that you can see the capitulum. The posterior side of the bone is much more featureless, but that olecranon fossa is quite deep um, and really sets that apart and the fact that you can't see the capitulum. So those... Um, features at the distal end of the bone, two condyles, two epicondyles, and two fossas are the features that you should know there. Okay, and now let's turn our attention to the forearm. Forearm contains two bones, the radius and the ulna. The radius is the lateral bone, the ulna is the medial bone. In the bone list that I've given you, there are 12 features between these two bones, and they're probably best studied together, side by side. Six of these 12 features, half of everything, is in the form of the head, the neck, and the notch on each of the bones. So notice, when you look at the two bones, where do the bones actually touch one another? And the answer, of course, is the head of each bone touches or fits into a feature on the opposite bone. So let's start with the radius, the bone there that you see above on the lateral side. 
The round whitish feature that you see there is the head of the radius. And then the narrowing immediately under the head would be the neck of the radius. So head and neck are very easy to see there. Look at the distal end now. Look at the ulna. The distal end of the ulna is a rounded feature. You can see it in white, which is the head of the ulna and the area where it narrows into the main body of the bone would be the neck of the ulna. Now, this bone sets people back for a minute because if you studied a number of long bones, the head of the bone is typically at the proximal end, the end above. And so this ulna is sort of an anomaly. The proximal end of the ulna is very busy with that big cutout. If you look at the bone to the right, um, which is the ulna, but just from a different position, you can see that there's a big sort of mouth-like cutout of the, on the bone. And that's very busy attaching itself to the humerus. So it turns out that on the ulna, the head is at the distal end. Interesting. So the head and the neck of each of these two bones should be fairly easy to identify. And that sets us up then to understand the notches. And the head of the radius is fit into a cutout area on the ulna, which is known as the radial notch. And you can see how the head of the radius in this picture seems to be uh, fitting deeply into the side of the ulna. And likewise, if you go down to the distal end, you can see that the head of the ulna seems to be fitting into a little cutout or a notch on the radius. And each of these two notches is named for the bone that fits into it. So follow me. At the proximal end, there's the head of the radius, and the neck of the radius, and the head of the radius fits into the radial notch of the ulna. Follow? At the distal end, same thing. The head of the ulna, the neck of the ulna, and the head of the ulna fits into the ulnar notch of the radius. Okay, so... <clears throat> the notches are named for the bone feature that fits into them, not for the bone that they're on. Now, when you can do that, when you can see head, neck, notch at one end, head, neck, notch at the other, you've got a pattern to fit into your mind. And now you've got six out of the 12 features identified. Let's look at them here. So here in this picture, I've colored those in, the head of the radius and the teal color, the neck of the radius, and the little arrow pointing into the notch, the feature on the ulna, and that would be the radial notch of the ulna. At the distal end, head of the ulna in a dark blue color with a green neck, and pointing out the ulnar notch, the notch on the radius that the head of the ulna fits into. So, as I said before, that gives you six out of the 12 features. Now, let's pick out another pair that are fairly easy. Look at the very distal end of both bones. And you can see both bones have a pointed feature on them. On the ulna, the pointed feature is very prominent because you've got this rounded head. The radius, when you get down to the distal end, is pretty wide, and 180 degrees from that notch we were talking about is this pointed feature called the styloid process. It's the styloid process of the radius. Over in the picture on the right, um, we've colored the styloid process of the ulna yellow. And you can see that these two point away from each other and create sort of a U-shaped area just beyond the distal ends of the bone. And that, of course, is where the hand is going to fit. And these sort of cup around the carpal bones of the hand. So, 
six name the six head neck notches now now two um, styloid processes and please make sure that you write the name of the bone that it's on as well if you write styloid process you should write styloid process of the whatever whatever it is radius or ulna now that leaves you with four features one is on the radius and let's look back toward the proximal end you see the bicipital tuberosity some books will call this radial tuberosity it's a very prominent lump below the neck of the radius it's always very easily distinguished I call it the bicipital tuberosity because in fact the biceps brachii muscle, the big lumpy muscle of the upper arm, anchors into the forearm right here. And so I, I like to use bicipital tuberosity because it reminds me of that muscle attachment. Radial tuberosity is adequate. It, it is that. It's the tuberosity of the radius. But once you've put that on the radius, now you have the entire radius. You have the head of the radius, the neck of the radius, the bicipital tuberosity, and then down at the distal end, the styloid process and the ulnar notch. Now, at the proximal end of the ulna, there are three features. You see them there in purple, yellow, and green. Look at the bone to the right, uh, the ulna shape to the right, where we're looking at it from the side, and you can see this more clearly, I think. The curved mouth-like feature is in green, and is known as the trochlear notch. And I think most of you, if you studied the humerus, would recognize that that comes from the word trochlea, which was that medial condyle on the distal end of the humerus. The other two features are both processes. The olecranon process in purple is the main lumpy end of the bone. And this, in fact, is what you and I call your elbow. If you bend your arm, if you flex it so that the bone at the point of your elbow really juts out, most people call that their elbow, and that is in fact the olecranon process. And look at the letters in the word, it's pronounced olecranon process. So very important prominent feature. You should know that the point of your elbow is your olecranon. And that sort of forms the head and part of the upper lip of this mouth-like feature. Notice that the lower lip is in yellow, and this feature is referred to as the coronoid process. Coronoid process. The word coronoid here comes from the word corona. Many people think of a beer right away, but uh, it's not a beer, but the fact that the symbol for that beer is a crown. The word corona in Spanish means a crown. And the coronoid process is not the whole crown, but if you're familiar with the basic shape of a crown, it's usually a, a gold circle of metal that you put on a king's head or a queen's head, but it typically has little triangular points on it, like uh, little rays of light. And you can see this if you look to the ulna that's positioned to the left, see how the shape of that coronoid process is like a little triangular tooth on the upper margin of a crown. So coronoid here. Let me also say that I should warn you here, um, perhaps you remember on the scapula, we found a coracoid process. This is a coronoid process. You would be, you would do well to put these two bones side by side. I'm sorry, not the two bones. Put these two words side by side so you can see clearly their difference and make sure that you put the right one in the right place. Um, this is not uncommon for me to see on tests or quizzes or wherever that people call the coronoid the coracoid or vice versa. So, three features here. Now, what is significant, too, is perhaps you remember when we studied the humerus, uh, 
There was an olecran on fossa, a trochlea, and a coronoid fossa. So obviously there are three names here that are used both on the ulna and the humerus. And let's look at that in another picture here. This is an arm upside down, so the humerus is below and the radius and ulna are above. But we're on the medial side, so we clearly see how the mouth, that cutout part of the ulna, fits against the trochlea. And so the trochlea feature of the humerus fits into the trochlear notch of the ulna. So trochlea matches the trochlea. The roundness of the trochlea fits into the round cutout of the trochlear notch. Likewise, you can see the big prominent olecranon process here, the point of your elbow. As you straighten your arm, maybe you can imagine this going straight, notice how the olecranon process is going to fit deep into the olecranon fossa. And this, of course, is how your elbow seems to disappear when you straighten your arm. When your arm is bent, that olecranon process is very, very prominent, sticks out quite a bit. But straighten your arm and it seems to go away. Well, it doesn't, but it hides in this deep posterior fossa called the olecranon fossa. And then likewise, on the anterior side of the bone, the coronoid process is on the anterior side of the bone. And when you flex or bend your arm, the ulna, the anterior side of the ulna comes up and the coronoid process fits right into that little hollow coronoid fossa on the anterior side of the humerus. Uh, you can't do better than to try and get a hold of a humerus and an ulna, fit them together at the trochlea, and really see how these six features, three on the humerus, three on the ulna, all match, and that the names are similar from bone to bone. Okay, so take some time looking at that and really getting to know these. So there's the radius and the ulna. Finally, let's look at the hand. The hand is laid out in many ways like the foot, obviously not the same shape, but the same three sets of bones. You see the little short bones called the carpals that fit against the radius and the ulna. Uh, there are eight of those little bones, and they are the real challenge in learning the bones of the hand. The metacarpals are the five metacarpals, numbering from the thumb, which is the number one, across to the metacarpal below the little finger, which would be number five. So these are very straightforward. And of course, if you've learned phalanges already, the 14 phalanges here are identical to the ones in the toe. There's a, a proximal and a distal phalanx in the thumb or the first finger. And then there are three in each of the fingers, two through five, a proximal, a middle, not medial, proximal, middle, and distal phalanx in each of those four fingers, which makes a total of 14. So the challenge is really the carpals. It helps if you take a picture like this and actually color them in, right? And here you see all eight bones colored. Uh, they're in two rows of four. There's a row of four that joint with the metacarpals, as you can see. And there are four that fit against the wrist. And the four that you see close to the wrist are in actually a different little joint structure than the four that are near the metacarpals. Um, look at the anterior view of the hand and you can see there's actually side by side just three bones next to the wrist. The grain, the 
the pinkish color and the purple color, or the dark, dark blue, purple sort of color. The little yellow bone is the fourth bone, but notice how it sits on the dark purple one facing towards us. It juts out towards us. So it's actually not side by side, but sitting on that bone. Look at the posterior picture to your right. You cannot even see that little bone from the posterior side. Now, I've seen a number of pictures that will show that little bone, that little yellow bone sort of peeking out um, in some posterior pictures. But uh, in reality, you typically can't see that bone because it's oriented directly forward or anterior. So still learn four at a time. Learn the four that fit against the metacarpals. The one that the thumb is attached to is the trapezium. You might know that the first metacarpal, one with the number one on it, and the little red bone there, the trapezium, are where the saddle joint is that makes your thumb opposable, that gives it extra flexibility to be used with your fingers. And I always think of a little short rhyme that the thumb is on the trapezium. Or picture a trapeze artist who's almost slipped and fallen and is just hanging onto the trapeze by his thumb. That image might be able to give you the trapezium, okay? The bone next to that, the uh, lighter purple bone, is the trapezoid. And notice that the two traps are side by side. If you can get the trapezium right, you can probably place the trapezoid. And then in yellow, the capitate, and in a teal color, the hamate. So trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate are the four bones next to the metacarpals from lateral to medial. Okay. Now, come back. You know where the trapezium is, so the bone right below that, the one next to the radius, is the scaphoid in green. Uh, the light sort of pinkish one is the lunate bone next to that. And the third one in line is triquetrum. Okay, look at the word, triquetrum. So those are the three that are side by side there. And then the fourth one is called the pisiform. And it's like a little pea, and it sits on the bone. And in fact, you can palpate your pisiform. If you find the very base of your hand, right where it's next to the wrist, on the little finger or the medial side, press the thumb of one hand right into the very corner of the palm of your hand, right down next to the wrist, and you'll feel a bony lump right there in the corner of the palm of your hand. And that little bone is your piece of form. You can feel that. So, eight bones, make sure you know them from an anterior view and a posterior view. Make sure you use the thumb as a reference point to start your naming on either of the two rows. Uh, some people um, will actually use a little sort of um, an acronym to help do this. Maybe you remember from a math class learning, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. It was a way to put in order the processes that you had to do to solve a, a algebraic equation. Uh, the P standard for the P and please standard for parentheses that you would solve that first. The excuse stood for exponents. Squares or cubes would be solved next in an algebraic equation. And then my dear was multiply, divide, and add and subtract was Aunt Sally. So those six words put in order the processes that you need to do, and an algebraic equation will always be solved correctly if you do the processes in order. Um, here, if we start with the bone, the trapezium, the letters are T, T, C, H, right, across next to the metacarpals, and then if you come back under the thumb, 
and start the second row, scaphoid, lunate, you've got SLTP. Um, a student of my mine many years ago came up with this, and people have come up with different ones. You might want to invent your own. But um, if you start there with a trapezium, um, the letters are TTCH, the teacher can help. Come back to the scaphoid, students learn the process. The teacher can help students learn the process. Those eight words give you at least the first letter located on each one of the eight bones. So if you know what there's a piece of form, you know where it is. If you know there's a lunate, you know where it is. If you know there's a hamate, you know which one it is by putting the letter H on it. There are three T's, but hopefully the two traps will help you place them where they belong and the triquetrum can go in the other spot. So there you have it. There are the bones of the upper limb. Much more effective studying these if you've really got the bones themselves and a number of other things that I could point out as we go. But at least this will give you some semblance of identifying features and bones that are, that are important in the upper limb.